I was inspired to bring Imaginary together because I was challenged by Jason Blum to make a really slow, creepy movie. And I just wanted to try a very kind of slow, terrifying supernatural thriller. So to make a very slow, scary, supernatural uh, horror movie, you just have to turn the volume down, right? So you just have to slow down, you have to take your time, you have to allow the audience the moments to explore the negative space in the shots. And what that does is it allows them to use their imagination to project what evil might be lurking behind our main characters. A major motif in the film is the artwork that our lead character creates. Jessica is an illustrator and she has a series of children's books called Molly Millipede. And she's taken a lot of these terrifying images from her dreams, but also from her past, and tried to understand them, try to work them out through her artwork and her books. So what's cool for me about that as a filmmaker is we're able to seed a lot of these ideas, a lot of these visuals, the, the hallway, the blue door, the spider. You see sort of the children's version of these things in these sort of Lewis Carroll-esque books, but you see how she's taken these things that have happened to her and she's tried to process them through her, her creative assets, right, to generate something that she can try to understand and share with the world. Dewanda Wise is playing Jessica Barnes in the film and she, I mean, I just don't really have the words to describe Dewanda. She is magnetic, charismatic, um, vulnerable, strong, smart, insightful, empathetic. What I love about her is that she's bringing so much of herself to the role of Jessica, but she's also trying to create a character that's different than herself and different than some of the roles she's played in the past. Uh, she's an executive producer on the film. She's been just a, a tremendous partner and collaborator, and I, I've loved every minute of working with her. Piper, I mean, I can think of maybe two other times in my career when I've been in an audition, and when the audition finished, I went, uh, that's the person. I, we actually have an expression in Hollywood, we say, put them in makeup, which means like, get them to set, put them in makeup, they're in the movie. And I turned to my casting director after that audition and I said, get her in makeup, she is it. And we had all these problems casting her because she's you know, so talented, she was on another show, she was committed. And at one point it looked like we weren't gonna get her and, and my partners at Blumhouse said, you might wanna think about someone else for this role. And I said, no, no, she's it. We have to have her, we have to have Piper. She's that kind of talent. Tegan is fantastic in the film. She is brings the perfect mixture of sort of youthfulness and um, adolescence to the role, but also maturity and knowledge of life and experience. Uh, it's a hard line to walk. You know, a lot of actresses we looked at for the role, they seemed just too mature, they seemed too much, you didn't buy them in this sort of adolescent phase still. But then we looked at some other actresses who read as teenagers, but they just didn't have the experience. Uh, you didn't see the, you know, the that they were carrying any sense of trauma, right? That ultimately uh, Taylor has to bring to the movie. Uh, and watching Dewanda work with Tegan has been fantastic too. I didn't, I didn't speak about their dynamic yet, but it's been interesting to watch, whereas Dewanda is really focused in on Piper and, and having that sort of real kind of mentor connection with, with Piper, almost parental. With, with Tegan, she's really developed a friendship and they seem like buddies, which at first you think it's kind of weird, it's 15, how is that possible? But Dewanda has created this bond with her that really translates to the screen because ultimately that is the central relationship in the movie is the relationship between Taylor and Jessica. So the way you make something wonderful, like a stuffed animal, creepy, is you just kind of make it off by like 5%. So you look at Chauncey, his eyes are asymmetrical, his, his ears out of whack and that's something that I really learned from James Wan that he talked a lot about when he looked at the script because uh, he's a part of Blumhouse now and and we really leaned into that idea and also implying that there's something else going on like something childlike and wonderful is fine when it's in the foreground but what's going on in the background what if there's something else something a little more sinister and that's where this idea of the entity came from too it was, it was a note from uh, James Wan as well this this notion that that the evil is not just 
the bear, but it's actually something else that's manipulating the bear, projecting the bear uh, for our characters to see. The Never Ever is a place that's always shifting and it's a reflection of what you want and what you fear. It's a kind of almost a, a tactile representation of your psyche. You know, in life we have all these choices. We have all these doors we can walk through. And I wanted the Never Ever to reflect that. It should physically have just doors, more doors than you can imagine. And it's obviously influenced by the artwork of M.C. Escher and Salvador Dali, so it has a surreal quality, but it's still grounded in the real world, if that makes sense. I will always choose a practical plus uh, VFX approach, because what that does is it gives the actor something to play against. It creates a reality, and it's not just for the talent on camera, it's for the audience in the theaters, because they can feel the weight of something real. And so what you want to do is you want to trick the audience. You want to present something real, so they're focused on the real thing, so the actors are focused on the real thing, but then you change something they're not looking at, right? So if it's if it's a, a puppet, right? You, you have the real thing there, and there, there's rods, there maybe even is a puppeteer behind it, but you paint out the rods, you paint out the puppeteer, but the thing that they're looking at is the real thing. So that applies to sets too, you know. At one point we talked about is the never ever just a CG set. I said, no, 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 we wanna, we wanna build a real set because this is a fantastic place and it has to have a weight, it has to have a reality to it. We have to believe that we're in a real place and then we'll just augment it with VFX. We'll do little things that make it seem a little bit more fantastical but we wanna ground it in, in a reality. So our movie is set in Louisiana. It begins in New Orleans and they move into the suburbs but we've made a choice to kind of get away from the cliche Southern Gothic thing. This is much more of a story about American families and American middle class, but also modern American families, blended families, people from different backgrounds coming together, but also people wanting to return to their roots, you know, to, to start to look back on their childhood and, and take the good parts and try to understand the, the parts that maybe weren't so good. So while it is very much set in Louisiana, I think it's really more of an, uh, a movie about Americana and the American family. And I've loved it. The crews are amazing. The producers I'm working with are so knowledgeable and confident. Paige and Paul have been tremendous partners. I've absolutely had the best time here. Everyone works so hard. They're so talented. Uh, if I could pick another place to go and shoot a movie, I would, I would pick here. I hope audiences take away from this film that imaginary friends might not be imaginary and that they can be a lot of different things to different people. They can be wonderful companions, they can be terrifying monsters, and they can also be vengeful spirits who will not let go. We want them to watch the movie, and we want them to think about their own families and their own childhood and their own imagination, and think about whether or not they had an imaginary friend and how they feel about that, and realize that while that can be a beautiful thing, it also can be a really scary thing. We can also suggest that maybe that imaginary friend you had when you were a kid, maybe it wasn't as imaginary as you thought. And then that becomes a way to explore bigger ideas, bigger emotions, bigger themes. And I think just as the actors have found different themes and just as my collaborators have found different ideas to latch onto, I think the audience will find their own when they watch the film.